open source GLORP OR matching library, which I think uh, ties in a little bit to this topic. Lo uh, Alan has a long experience in small talk and with objects, was chief architect of the Toplink family of products uh, prior to coming to Syncom. So let's uh, welcome Alan. PowerPoint slides just disappeared here for a moment. My laptop has uh, zero batteries left, so I have to actually shut it down before <laughs> coming up to the front of the room, and then it's tricky to do anything in 1024 by 768, which I have dutifully turned it down to. I'll try not to touch anything. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, things in store that um, we have done or looking at doing. Um, I am the engineering manager. Is that me or? Okay. okay. Um, a motto for exceptions. This too will pass. Uh, I'm the engineering manager, um, and I'm wearing a nice engineering manager shirt today, but I'm primarily going to talk about this at a technical level. Um, mandatory nice picture of our boxes. And so I'm going to talk very briefly about concepts behind store. And something that I don't think has been talked about uh, before is how we're using store internally in our own processes. And um, that's not to suggest that this is the way everybody ought to use it, uh, but I think it might be interesting for people to see that. Uh, and if may, there may be things they can learn from that, or maybe they can understand why it doesn't work as well with the way they use it. Um, also, some of the, the current work that's been done in store um, work on tools, work on the database back end, work on the way that we do loading. Um, and years ago and ever since, there were one of the things I said about store is that um, at a fundamental level, I, I, I like the way it's built. Um, I think that storing things in a relational back end or at least a back end that allows arbitrary querying uh, gives you a lot of flexibility on things. You get nice transactional storage. Uh, and there were only three major things that I really wanted to do to store. Uh, rewrite the front end, rewrite the back end, and rewrite the middle. And um, we've made a lot of progress on those items. So store is the source code control system which is used in the Syncom Smalltalk family of products, which is VisualWorks, Object Studio, and Web Velocity. It started out many years ago um, when IBM had acquired OTI and it started to be difficult to be using NV Manager anymore and um, you know its own source control manager was needed. Um, as I say, it's, it's got a relational database back end. It is a central database, so in that sense it's not a distributed version control system, but it actually has aspects of uh, being distributed in that you can replicate things from uh, database to database. And a lot of people, uh, especially in the not quite so good old days when Syncom's network connectivity for people working from home was weak, a lot of people ran local databases at home and replicated things back and forth. Um, I wrote the original GLORP replication and the reason I wrote it was that my connection to the database in California did not stay up long enough and it bothered me. Um, and in fact, within Syncom right now, we have three databases that we replicate back and forth between uh, Oracle, SQL Server, and PostgreSQL. Uh, so we actually have all of those in production use for our own stuff. Um, and one aspect of it that often sort of comes up in the Smalltalk community, 
that, um, well also like Monticello, which is, is probably the other main version control system in use at this point, well, no, I'm excluding Visual Age, and like NV Manager, uh, it is uh, state-based. It is not like a file-in that records your changes, it records a snapshot of the state of a particular package. Uh, so I said I'd talk about some of the internal uh, SimCom processes. So we have a, a system for what we call action requests, which is the generic term for bug requests, enhancement requests, which we call MARS, which is confusing with Esteban's project he just talked about upstairs. But we had the name first. <laughs> and, um, and so we keep track of things in that by AR number. And so if I bring this up here, which will probably have too small of a font to see, but here's a list of ARs which are assigned with the product area of Glorp. And they all have numbers, and that's not all that interesting. But what we do um, is, is we have a convention. We use naming conventions to distinguish the, um, the trunk and the branches which is not necessarily ideal, but it's very easy to implement. And so we would have a version number for our trunk, like 771-132, and if I'm working on AR number 55555, I would append that plus AR55555 and a, an increment number to, uh, to the trunk version number. And so using that, I can fairly easily distinguish those, and we have tools that we would load in the image that more or less enforce those version naming conventions. So there's a dialog that would pop up, ask you what AR you're working on, you put in the number and it will put the convention there for you so that you don't, you at least don't run the risk of mistyping the spacing on the convention. Uh, you may type in the AR number wrong, but, but uh, that's sort of the limit of your risk. Everything that we do, the code goes into one of these branches uh, and then once the code goes through review, part of our process is that everything has a reviewer uh, either inherently because it was pair programmed or because someone did it and then someone else reviewed it later. Uh, once it's been reviewed, it's integrated, which means you merge it in and you publish it in one of these trunk versions, and then our, our build process will pick up those trunk versions. Uh, that also gives us sort of traceability that everything, there's a part, another piece of the tool is that I can type in the AR number and see exactly what the changes were that were made for that AR. Um, so, and there's a slide about that, so it will pop up a dialog such as the one I'm showing on this screen that says for AR number 49044, there were three things modified, and it'll tell me that one of those I don't have loaded because the tests aren't in this image, bad Alan, um, and the other bits I can either compare them or I can merge them or I can load them. Um, this is done at the package level, um, so one of the things that was a really nice property in Envy with its open editions is that you could spend most of your time working at sort of the bottom level packages and only every once in a while did you have to go up and version the top level constructs. And it was a real pain when you had to, but you didn't have to do it very often. And this gives you a little bit of the same sort of property because you're, you're operating at the package level up to the point where you're going to do a merge onto the trunk. The, the IDE with this small additional package knows what you're working on, supports the naming convention. And all of this, um, it wasn't really thought out particularly in advance. It evolved with people fixing things. It's extremely simple, uh, very minimal, but it's, it's actually worked quite well for us. Another thing that we do in the XP sort of practice is that we have, at least for changes to the real base system, a shared integration image. Uh, so somebody will VNC into that, it's always up to date because we have these head scripts that you bring up the integration image, it will automatically load the latest trunk of everything. So that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of our processes, although I'd be happy to expand on that if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards in the remaining you know, half an hour of the conference while we're eating lunch. Um, so we've done a lot of work on tools, atomic loading, the database backend, and some other bits and pieces, things like redoing the garbage collection, uh, adding constraints and indexes into the database, um, and, and some other smaller bits. 
So tools, we have done major revisions of most of the store tools and we're going to get to the rest of them. Um, inevitably, this causes some disruptions and I know some of you in the audience have experienced such disruptions, but we would like to think that these represent significant progress. Um, I certainly think many of the tools are now much improved, although they, we still have a lot of improvements to make. You know, with the, with the old tools, I mean, one of the problems, which probably wasn't that visible to external users, is that they were using a very old browser framework that we really would like to just be able to delete from the image, uh, but couldn't because the store tools were using it. One of the symptoms of that is that those tools were inconsistent with the rest of the tools in the system and with each other. Um, their internals were not very good, their UIs were not very good, and they were slow. Um, you know, I had complained about the previous iteration of the merge tool that I don't understand why doing a merge where we're being very clever about what we're reading from the database should somehow take longer than it would take to just read all the intervening versions from the database and compare them in memory. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So in the newer version, um, you know, the browsing of versions in the database now happens in the refactoring browser. So we did some refactoring of the refactoring browser. There's an abstract superclass. When you bring it up, you are seeing something with the same uh, internal mechanisms that you would get browsing the system code. Probably one of the biggest items there is just making sure that many of the menu items that don't apply to live, that only apply to live code aren't there and causing walkbacks or mysteriously grayed out when you're browsing code in the database. Uh, the code comparison has been completely rewritten um, there's, there's a, a nice framework for that, although I think we still have to really get that tool finished. Um, and I mentioned the merge tool has, a new, has, has had a new UI for a while. It has new internals now as well. The garbage collector UI is thoroughly redone, as are its internals. Loading. So the previous way that you loaded code in store was essentially equivalent to filing. We'd go read the code out of the database, except there's no order on the code in the database, or there's some very limited ordering. And then we would compile the class definitions and the methods one by one. So if you tried to load some code and it didn't load into this image because of some changes that had been made or whatever other reason, your image is broken. You've got a package which is halfway filed in. You, know, you had dependencies on order within that, so there is you know, we would read them out of the database, the database will give them to us in semi-random order, and that might not be the order that will work. DLLCC was something that was particularly subject to that because it was sensitive to the order of definitions. And so there were a lot of things in the nature of, well, if you're loading DLLCC code, either publish it binary, which has its own issues, or put in some do it at the end that recompiles all the definitions a couple of times, um, it wasn't pleasant. And if you're loading code uh, that did brain surgery on itself or on the image, which we do a lot, you know, move classes from one package to another within base visual works, or let's change the implementation of symbols or something like that, you get a lot of dependency on orders. Or um, actually probably the worst thing I can think of was when Andres Valud did the uh, changes to the hashing mechanism a few releases ago, and the integration instructions for that were, you know, here are half a dozen intermediate versions. You have to load one after the other in sequence. So we have moved away from that in the more recent versions. We have what we're calling atomic loading or sometimes shadow loading, and this works by compiling the code all at once off somewhere else. And one of the interesting things about that, I mean, that this is not new. NV did that. The parcel loading mechanism sort of does that. It constructs the code. It doesn't compile it off separately and then installs it. But this is actually done using the core system mechanism. So VisualWorks has for a while had namespaces, and there have been arguments over how they were done and what they were useful for. But one of the things that they're used for here, which is kind of neat, is I just create a shadow of the namespace structure that this code is going to have that I'm loading, compile the code, put it into these other namespaces, and then when it's all ready, take it and copy it over into the real namespaces all at once. 
um, and so I've described this as brain surgery made easy. There's still a few gotchas associated with that. Not all brain surgery can be made do it, do it yourself at home kind of easy. One of the things that, that can be difficult is if you're adding a compiler or changing a compiler. So for example, DLLCC has its own compiler that understands C style method definitions. Um, you, you can't compile everything all at once because the first thing you're doing is loading the compiler that you're going to use to compile the rest of the code or chunks of the rest of the code. And people do this themselves in other areas. There's the AP parser compiler. People do this in different ways. Uh, Object Studio d installs a compiler which then modifies Visual Work. Well, no, it, which then compiles Object Studio code differently than Visual Works code. So there's the possibility that you may need to install some packages early. And in some cases, we'll recognize that automatically. So if you define a subclass of parser, we're going to say, we probably should install this package as soon as we're done with it. Uh, but we're not going to recognize all of those cases. So also, if you just put a property on your package called install before continuing, then we will say, once we're done with this package, install everything up to this point, and then keep going. Uh, this is done at the package granularity, so there might be things that don't work with that. Um, for example, there's the AT parser compiler itself, which defines its compiler partly in itself, and that's just kind of a tricky case. Um, but it's much, much better than it was. What we're doing in the upcoming 7.8 release, we're also doing what we call the analysis loader. So the current loader, it is atomic, but what it does is compile package A, then package B, then package C, then install everything at once. And that works well. There's, there's a distinction in the use of packages, especially within a bundle, where uh, you may have a bundle which is just aggregating a bunch of stuff which is independently loadable, or you might have a bundle which is really just being used for categorization. Um, so, for example, Glorp is more or less that way. Glorp has a bundle which has a bunch of sub-packages, but they're not, you can't load them independently, or if you could, they wouldn't do anything. Base Visual Works has a lot of code which is like that because it was based on class categories in Smalltalk 80 many years ago, and they've not been really seriously reorganized. We have the ability in current versions to actually annotate things to say whether those pieces are individually loadable or not. But if you have a, pa a bundle which is basically using packages as a grouping mechanism, the analysis loader would be very useful because it will look at what the, the whole bundle as a piece and then decide for itself what order it thinks those definitions need to be compiled in. And you know, this again will make it more robust, more able to load more code without problems. Uh, the database level. So there were a number of problems with the database, which I could go on about for some time, but I don't have that much time. So one of them is the, the schema. There are things in the schema that if you're a database person, which there probably aren't very many here, but you would, you know, put your head in your hands and then beat it on the desk, you know, what were they thinking? In addition to that, the way that it did the object relational mapping was pretty naive. So the schema's strange, and we don't have a mapping that's really able to let us optimize for that schema. It's extremely hard to change the schema because it is hard-coded into um, the mapping. I mean, it literally does select star and then assumes it knows exactly what fields it's going to get back. So you can't even add a column to a table. There really isn't any kind of a model. There are records. They correspond precisely to the table. Um, I'm sure there's some kind of a dig I could get in there at Ruby and their active records, but basically when you have records, you don't have objects. Um, and so in the, the recent releases, we have moved to using the Glorp framework and uh, a layer on top of that called Store for Glorp, which provides a mapping for an actual domain model of store objects. And you know, I think this is a good thing, and it's not just because I wrote Glorp. Um, this has a lot of advantages, a lot of ability to optimize. Um, 
you know, much more flexibility and a model. There are also trade-offs in there. So one of them is space versus time. Uh, Glorp uses a lot more space or potentially uses a lot more space because of some of the optimizations it does. So the old framework would just say, I'm going to publish something, I will spit out rows one at a time to the database. Glorp says, I am going to publish something, let me figure out what I'm going to write to the database, think about it, and then write it all at once. So if I'm writing, I can use features like Oracle Array Binding, which will let me write in 26 SQL statements, no matter how big the thing is that I'm writing, because there are 13 tables and 13 sequence operations. Um, you know, it's constant, at least constant round trips, if not constant time. However, that means that I've constructed a big set of objects in memory before I go out to the database, and if I've got a very large thing that I'm publishing, that can be an issue. So you have to, you know, play around with some of that. There's also the question, Glorp, when it reads things, it caches it. I don't really want to cache everything forever. If somebody's doing a lot of version browsing, I can end up pulling in huge amounts of stuff. So those are things that, you know, need to be, be sorted out. There are also uh, things we've done, database constraints and indexes. So we've added some constraints. For example, you can't have two package versions that have the same version name once you've done the appropriate update to the database. So that helps ensure the integrity in the database, and with the indexes, certain things become much faster. Wow, how clever. We thought of putting indexes on things. Um, in addition, uh, there are things at the image level where uh, overrides, there were a number of interesting things you could do with complex cases in overrides. Those are treated much better now. Uh, things like preserving the history across a package rename. So if I rename a package I, and look at its history, I still know what, what was done. Uh, if I'm having databases, especially with replication or being published to by people in different time zones, it's nice if the timestamps are consistent. So on the, we use the server timestamp, but we display it in the local time zone of the machine that you're looking at it on. Uh, we've done a bunch of work on getting rid of hard-coded dialogues that would pop up during different store operations so that it's more friendly to automated builds. Uh, and I think, you know, as Stefan said, 85% of all bug fixes are trivial. Just do them. Um, and then, what are the future possibilities we're going to look at? So, we know, for example, we're, we're, we are absolutely going to do future tools improvements. At some point, we are going to make a fairly significant changes to the schema. That's something we have to balance with backward compatibility fairly carefully. Uh, there are definitely going to be some further optimizations going on. One of the big areas in terms of feature expansion is adding better support for what I will loosely call configuration management. Um, every five people you talk to have seven different definitions for what that means. Uh, but, you know, support for that area in general. One of the things I mean by that, the ability to work with components that are larger or that have conflicts, that you're not all, you don't have to load everything into the image in order to work with it. Uh, being able to have logic for different variations of the same thing for different platforms, different configurations. And one of the things I consider important is this level independence. What I talked about earlier, that I can work with packages, I can work with bundles, I can work with sub-bundles, and to some extent I don't have to care. And there are a lot of interesting possibilities. And so one thing that I thought I would do is, is a demo of one interesting possibility. And I want to emphasize that this is not a you know, Syncom future product direction. This is not a commitment to do anything. This is something Alan thought would be cool to demo. It is put together out of spaghetti tape and marshmallows, and I'm hoping that it doesn't fall over when I put the marshmallow on the top. And so the thing that I was going to talk about was a store server. So I said, you know, now I can publish with 26 round trips to the database to Oracle, no matter how big it is. 26 is still not a small number if my database is remote. So I'd really like, some people have asked, you know, couldn't I have a store server where I could just go to a server which I install and I load? And I think, yes, that would have its advantages. On the other hand, it gives me recurring nightmares about configuring EMServe back in the old days. 
but I thought it, you know, it would be kind of a cool thing. And one of the other things I get is that, you know, people, especially my managers, you know, I say things like, well, we've put a real domain model behind this now. Yes, but what does it do? Well, we've really refactored the code and we've put a real domain model behind it now, so it's much better. So you spend a bunch of time puttering on the code and it doesn't do anything. No, no, it's, it's really very cool. So, so I thought it would be good to be able to demonstrate something that you could usefully do with a real domain model. And so I thought, why not have a store server? And so I implemented one one weekend and I thought, for bonus points, let's put it in the cloud. So I have running here in Amazon's EC2 an instance, and it's running Windows, I apologize, that's what the guy who put it together gave me. And then I can use the remote desktop and it's easy. And I'll log in as administrator, best practices. And now I have an image running here, and this is the dumbest, simplest possible sort of server. I didn't use Seaside, I used really raw open talk HTTP listener that understands how to do three things. And so I will go start the server. Now I will go minimize <laughs> that image and I will come back to an image running on my local machine here. And I've set the URL to this weirdo thing and I will say run and up comes something that looks a little bit like the published items list, only the way it got the list, and it has a very reduced set of database items. Um, I'm gonna go like three minutes over, but. Um, it has a very reduced database with only a couple of things in it, but it's going out and getting those by issuing HTTP requests. And I could go in a web browser and what it's really doing there is giving me, you know, new line separated list of these things and I can click on one of those and it'll come back with a list and it's going to a MySQL database that's running in the cloud and I can click on a version here. And the really cool part here is that there's one menu item called load. And what that's gonna do is go to a database running on this remote machine, read in those domain objects. It'll make a copy of them because when I make a copy, it'll get rid of the proxies that would be annoying and space consuming when I serialize them. Um, put that into a boss stream, serialize it over an HTTP re web request. I say load, it gets over to the image side here. I send it the message load source and it does it. All the store APIs just work. Um, to be honest, I had to tweak two really tiny things to make it work. Actually one of them it would have worked but it you know, serialized an extra 500K. Um, and so I loaded the gremlin goodie. This is some little tiny goodie that Vasily wrote that makes things pop up in your image every now and then. Uh, and that works. And I thought that was a really cool demo that now we're using this in the cloud. And then I thought, because I couldn't be satisfied and I still had several days before my demo worked, let's stop that. And what if instead of just having this relational database, I had something else people asked for and I did it with gemstone. So I did exactly the same thing, and you know, it's, it's got like four methods. They do practically nothing. But so let's, you know, go down here and say self start server listing on the same port with gemstone. And, and now this is not the greatest of demos because what I'm gonna do is the same thing over here and it's gonna come up and look exactly the same. <laughs> um, and I will load SUnit2. And I will pick some version of that and say load and it'll go and do it. Uh, ah, yes, I ran it, okay. I should, have, I should have only stuck to the versions of things that I had hard coded. The one problem that I didn't work around there is that when Gemstone reads those things in, it uses the immutability flag on things, so when I serialize them, they're read only. And I really should have set the writable because this is doing a, uh, a test, so I will, in true small talk fashion, say self is immutable false, and keep going. Why would it give me that dialog? I shouldn't have done SUnit. Did I pick the package at random? All right, if I'd picked Gremlin again, <laughs> this would actually load, and it's, if I go back over here, <laughs> I should have thought of that. Um, and so I th to me, that's a nice example. Now, as I say, this is not something that's production level. This is, you know, paper clips and spaghetti. 
but it shows the kind of thing that you can do once you have that, that sort of capability. And with that, thank you. Are there any questions? Questions for Alan? We've got uh, a couple mics uh, in the back. It's, it's he's coming with the mic. I didn't understand what actually Gemstone did in this particular case. Can you? So what I went did too fast. in the EC2 image, if I go over here, there is a workspace somewhere, not that one, but rather this one. No. Hello. Oh, I know. It's, it's really hard to work in 1024 by 768. There we go. There is a workspace over here that will show you pretty much what I did. Nah, can't do that. So I say, read, all, read every store package that is in the database. I did that because it was the same the EC2 database over here. For each one, make a copy. For each one, set the primary key and set a mock session for it. Those are the two little tweaks I had to do. And then I say in Gemstone, put a global called store, give me a reference to it, um, and then put into a dictionary all of those versions grouped by name. So I've taken those store domain objects for everything that was in the database and put it into a dictionary in Gemstone. So when I issued the request that says, give me all of the versions for this, it's going in that dictionary, look up for this name key, give me the list of for each version that's in there, collect the name, running that inside the database, and send it back over HTTP. So it's doing you know, what I would expect out of a gemstone store server. I could believe that if this were to scale up to full repository size, I might need something better than one big dictionary. Uh, this, uh, may, I, may I ask a question to James? You may ask. Uh, there is a store um, version for gemstone around. I don't remember the name. And it looks very weird when you're using it. Is this, isn't this a far better solution for uh, the source code control for Gemstone S? Do it this way instead of using a relational database to no. store Gemstone source code? No, because that one actually works. And this is a, you know, <laughs> a demo that somebody, that James and I and Martin basically cobbled together in a few hours um, that, you know, only works for packages. It won't. It doesn't do bundles at all, and has many other limitations. But it might be a promising direction. And when I mean might be a promising direction, what I really mean is if this is really interesting to somebody to the point where they might be prepared to pull their wallet out, then you definitely should would want to talk to the two of us. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Alan. That was very interesting. Although I am 